Hi everyone, I'm Larry Williams, the director of the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, uh, and we're coming at you today from my new office in the College of Business Administration at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And it's my uh, great pleasure to welcome back to CARMA uh, the many-time CARMA contributor, CARMA drummer, and a dear friend, uh, Dr. Herman Aguinnis from George Washington University, who's here uh, to give a webcast uh, in an hour or so. Welcome back to CARMA, Herman. Thank you, Larry. Delighted to be here. So, um, Herman, in the, uh, the conversation that we had at dinner last night, we were reflecting uh, on our lives as doctoral students, and uh, I know that you've had a lot of work with doctoral students, uh, successful work with doctoral students, and you work closely with doctoral students. Um, how is it that their world is different than the world that you and I faced uh, as a doctoral student uh, 20 or more years ago? I would say uh, we're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, have you seen the, watched the movie The Perfect Storm? Mm -hmm. That movie shows how there were a number of events that would typically happen uh, separately, but one particular point in time, all of them occurred at the same time. And the confluence of these events led to an outcome that was, that was catastrophic. And I think, in a way, doctoral students in our field in general is facing a sort of perfect storm. And there are three factors that I can talk about, although there are many others, but I can highlight three. Number one, the obsession with publishing in just A journals, the existence of these lists. And if a faculty member or a student publishes anywhere else than in these journals, people would say it does not count. So you have published a book or written a paper based on two or three years of research, and if it's not published in an A journal, it doesn't count. So that's the first factor. The second factor, which is a consequence of the first one, is the increase in the number of submissions to journals. Some of these A top journals get more than a thousand papers a year, which means that each of the action editors is processing about a hundred new papers every year. Think about it. Every third day in your inbox you have a brand new paper that you need to read, send out to reviewers, and then write an action letter on. That doesn't even count the r rs that you have to process. So the workload is tremendous. So between the, uh, the pressure to publish in a journals, the first factor, and the number of uh, submissions, many of these journals have rejection rates of 90%, 93%, even 90, 95%. Uh, many, many papers are getting rejected, it is very, very hard to publish in this elite group of journals. And the third factor is the financial strain put on many business schools. Uh, that leads deans to think about creative ways to raise funds and also creative ways to save money. And many deans, unfortunately, see the doctoral program as a cost center because not only have very few students in the doctoral seminars, these students do not pay, and then you have an opportunity cost because you're removing a faculty member from the MBA classroom or the undergraduate classroom who are paying students, and you put that person in the doctoral seminar classroom with non-paying students. And that means that there are fewer and fewer seminars offered to doctoral students, particularly in the methods domain, many business schools are outsourcing methods courses, so PhD students have to go elsewhere to get their methods training, and sometimes that may or may not be applicable and appropriate. And it's creating a perfect storm because doctoral students are pressured to publish only in a very small number of outlets. Rejection rates are through the roof, and many of them do not have the tools the methods, the theory, the understanding to be able to succeed. And what is the outcome of all of these factors? People are trying to publish in these top journals by all means necessary. Which means that, as Larry said one time, you may torture the data until they confess, you may engage in 
uh, questionable research practices such as getting rid of outliers if that improves your effect sizes and you don't say anything about that in the paper or you try different uh, configurations of control variables in your model until you find a set that improves the effect sizes and enhances statistical significance again without mentioning that people engage in harking which is hypothesizing after results are known which means you don't find the results you expected but you go on a fishing expedition you find something and then retroactively create a hypothesis to justify those findings and many many other practices that lead to a, a true credibility crisis in the field because if you try to replicate or reproduce some of those studies it is almost impossible uh, to do because so many decisions and choices have been made that remain non-transparent and obscure to the reader. That's great. Those are very insightful comments. I'm glad you brought up the publication process um, because we spend a lot of time uh, hanging out with different groups of people. Uh, Herman was actually back here last weekend participating in the Society for Organizational Behavior meeting that I hosted of substantive researchers kind of talking about the problems going on in the review process. We spend a lot of time hanging out with methods people who have their view uh, on issues that are troubling them and it just seems like the, the real challenge is uh, that we all want to have success at having the published articles uh, be methodologically sound and using state-of-the-art recommended practices. But I, I think there's some sentiment amongst some folks that that's not the way that it's working. So from your vantage point, do you have a particular view on these issues that you'd like to share? I, I certainly do, and the issue that I mentioned earlier in terms of authors applies equally to reviewers. If you look at the boards of many of the journals, uh, they are populated by reviewers who received their PhDs many, many years ago. We've had many methodological advancements in the last decade or 20 years. Uh, these include uh, structured question modeling, hierarchical linear modeling, organizational research methods will have a new special issue uh, soon on the use of video technologies in terms of qualitative methods. And so what is a reviewer to do when he or she is asked to review a paper using a method with which the reviewer is not familiar? That puts the reviewer in a difficult situation and what many reviewers may do is just gloss over the methods quickly and just acknowledge to the editor in the private communication that I'm not really familiar with the methods but the story sounds good, sounds credible, the story of the of the paper but the papers that we write in journals are not novels they should be science so sure we like to write a story that is attractive and interesting counterintuitive but there needs to be a direct link between that story and the data and the methods in the paper. And so I think we also have a, big, a, big, a bit of an issue there because some of the reviewers uh, also may not be up to speed in terms of how to evaluate papers. And you and I and many others have been the recipients of letters from journals in which a reviewer may say that we should engage in a practice that we know is factually incorrect because research in the last decade has proven that point. So because of this issue, we're also trying to find a solution and propose a solution to some of these issues. And my students and I and, and co-authors have written a number of papers over the last eight or nine years with the title Best Practice Recommendations. So for example, we wrote a couple of papers in the Journal of Organizational Behavior on best practice recommendations on how to assess moderators using meta-analysis, best practice recommendations on how to assess moderators with multiple regression. We wrote a paper in the Journal of Management, best practice recommendations on how to assess moderators with multi-level modeling. Recently, two issues ago in the journal uh, Personnel Psychology, we wrote a paper on 
best practice recommendations on how to deal with control variables, a paper last year in organizational research methods, best practice recommendations on how to deal with outliers, all these issues that are kind of obscure and, and non-transparent. So we have in each of these papers a table, a sort of checklist that authors can use, that instructors of methods can use, that reviewers can also use when they evaluate papers. So this is our modest contribution to this, to this concern, which is some things we know, some practices are right, some practices are wrong, and some others we do not know. But these papers provide an update about the state of the science for each of these methodological domains. Um, but, so I guess the other side of that is that, that this, these articles exist, but how, what can we do to support the acquisition of the knowledge in those articles amongst the reviewers and the ash and editors that are going to be making the judgments about those papers? Well, there are two issues. If we, if we conceptualize this as a performance problem, right? Let's say the reviewer is not performing up to the task. Well, it's a performance issue. And we know a lot about performance. Uh, we have decades of research on performance. Uh, and we know that performance is determined by two factors. One, skills, knowledge, abilities, and the other one, motivation. So if we think that there's a performance issue with reviewers or authors, then we need to deal with these two factors. So in terms of skills and abilities and, motiv and, and, and knowledge, we need to train reviewers, we need to train authors on the appropriate use of methods. But on the other hand, we have the motivation as well. If the motivation to publish in eight journals is stronger than the motivation to apply the knowledge that we have about methods, the first one will win. Because if the incentive system is to publish in eight journals, by all means necessary, without assessing the impact or quality of those articles, then, then authors are very smart. They will go that route. They will do whatever it takes to publish. Uh, so, dealing with the training part is super important because if people do not have the knowledge, they cannot apply the knowledge. But the motivation to apply the knowledge is just as important. Okay, Herman, uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, obviously, during that time, since graduate school from now, you've been uh, extraordinarily successful in your scholarship. And so... I'm wondering, as you kind of look at yourself uh, as a researcher and as a writer, you know, what have been kind of the lessons that you've learned along the way that impact you as you approach a research project now, as compared to how you might have looked at it 20 years ago? That's, that's a very broad question. That's a good one. Uh, I'm not sure I have given so much thought to it. But as the saying goes, the more I know, the more I read, the more creative I become. So I think a consequence of reading and learning over time has allowed me to identify what I think may be an important question. Um, and I have created some, some procedures that I use myself to identify what may be a promising domain for research or a promising study. And I follow the advice by Herbert Simon, who suggested that researchers should engage in what he called a thought experiment. What is this? A thought experiment. When you think about a research idea, before you go out there and collect your data, think about what would happen if the data are already collected? Pretend that the study is done. Now, describe in your own words and your mind what the study has taught you, how the study is now changing the conversation from a theoretical standpoint. What have we learned that's new? What contributions for theory has the study made? And also think about contributions to practice. How is your study changing how organizations manage individuals or how interventions should be redesigned based on the new knowledge. 
So I actually do this thought experiment, maybe not, not explicitly, but I do think a lot about um, what the study will lead to in terms of its contribution way before I go ahead and decide to collect the data. I think that that idea of, of doing research with impact is something that I gained after many years of conducting research. I wasn't thinking that way when I was getting started. I would just go study after study and without really putting a lot of thought into the big picture of what kind of impact this is going to have. Okay, uh, I think it's time for us to head down to the webcast room. Uh, Herman, I'm very excited for your talk. Thanks so much for giving of your time and coming back to Lincoln, Nebraska two weekends in a row to present at Carmen. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much. All right.